we will be discussing today about the bhagavatam as its importance in our tradition and as presented by shila prabhupada so i'll be have, having a powerpoint which i'll be using to get direct the overall structure but we'll also taking we will take one section from the bhagavatam the section from which prabhupada quoted the most and we'll also be discussing some things from the markine bhagavad dharma which is prabhu which is the song which prabhupad composed on the jaladuta as he contemplated the mission the massive mission that he had of spreading krishna consciousness in the western world so let's begin and uh, as we move forward with each section as i said we will we'll go back and look at some verses periodically but <clears throat> let's start with some context so as was mentioned in the information about the program we'll be discussing these four points mm -hmm. historical significance of the bhagavatam mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then prominence of the bhagavatam in the gaudiya tradition then we'll discuss about so if we could say the first is in the broad body of indian literature what is the significance of the bhagavatam then within that what is the special significance of the bhagavatam within the gaudiya tradition and then taking that further we we'll look at what was prabhupada's expertise in expanding the bhagavatam tradition globally and then now these three we are not just going to cover them linearly i will cover them linearly but we'll also go over them cyclically that means once we understand prabhupada's diligence then we will get a better understanding of the significance and prominence of the bhagavatam also and then of course while talking about prabhupada's diligence i'll be focusing on relevance so these are four broad themes not necessarily discussed linearly but they'll be linear as well as cyclic we'll go through all of these themes so now we we'll look at the first point that so what is the significance of the bhagavatam the first point is that the vedic literature is very vast now the precise estimate of how vast the vedic literature is there are different different opinions about it but essentially it's quite clear that it is not a small book it is not a sm small set of literature it's a some some estimate there are million million verses over there Mm, so we start with that and now uh, this is not just uh, these million verses they talk about hundreds of topics the topics range from how to go about our daily life and how to pursue transcendence which is which is completely beyond the ambit of daily life so we could say this is the domain of artha our daily life and paramartha is transcendence so interestingly in the broad now the vedic literature have given rise to six systems of philosophy so these six systems of philosophy are broadly considered to be theistic systems and theistic means that these systems focus on the understanding of they accept the vedas and from the acceptance of the vedas they move forward and discuss how one can actually understand the vedic system of thought how we can actually understand the the broad body of vedic knowledge so so i'm not sure whether you are able to see these slides so let's look at this mm -hmm. okay so broadly speaking when we look at philosophy now in india there are lots of literature but we are going to focus on philosophical literature primarily so with respect to philosophy there are two distinct approaches one approach is that we accept the reality of everyday experience and seek a deeper reality through them a deeper understanding through them 
So what I'm experiencing right now is real. So, okay, I'm seeing this hand, I'm seeing this phone. So the phone is real that I'm touching the phone and experiencing some weight in my hand that is real. If I taste some food, the experiences that we have are real. However, there are layers to reality. And we need to go deeper to find what is the deepest reality. So the whole idea is philosophy. Philosophy means it is the search for truth. The Bhagavatam also, the first verse, what is this? Satyam Param Dhimahi. What is the ultimate reality? Supreme reality. Satyam Param. So it is not saying that there is only one Satya. There are, there are, many, there are many Satya, but there is a Param Satya. So one approach is that we accept the reality of everyday experiences. And then we start seeing, okay, what is, what is below this reality? So this is broadly the approach of Aristotle in the West. And this is the approach that led to the development of science. So Newton saw the apple falling and he accepted, yes, this apple has really fallen. But what made this apple fall? So there is something invisible beyond the visible. So science, in one sense, operates at least fundamentally on the basis that this, our observations with our senses are real. But based on that, if of, it often comes up with subtler, invisible principles. So Aristotle is, in one, some ways, his approach is, founds modern science. So that is one approach. And we'll discuss how the Bhagavatam integrates both these approaches. The other, ex, uh, the other approach is, reject the reality of everyday experiences and seek the reality beyond them. Means whatever we are experiencing, this is all illusion. This is a deception. And what is there beyond is the actual reality. So Plato in the Western tradition, in the Greek or Roman tradition, he, re he represents this approach. Now, if you see in our tradition, in the Indian tradition, Bhaskara is a Mimamsaka commentator. And Bhaskara, Bhaskara represents this approach. Sorry. And Shankaracharya represents this approach. That the reality, there is no reality to our everyday experiences. They are all illusory. They are all false. So now if you will see, we won't have time to go into it. But the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Tejo vari mridam yatha vinimayo yatati sargo amrusha. So Jiva Goswami and Sridhar Swami, both of them interpret this verse in different ways. So Sridhar Swami interprets the verse to say that the world is unreal, but it appears real because of the because of the arrangement of the Lord, because of the presence of the Lord. And whereas Jiva Goswami says that this world is real, but the deepest reality is the Supreme Lord. Now, and this world is real and the world has its reality because the Lord is the supreme reality. So, so the Bhagavatam, in one sense, integrates both these approaches. So we can, in one sense, reject our everyday experience. And so that is, we could say, the path of Jnana. Okay, this whole world and everything that I experience in the world is just Maya. Give it up and then seek transcendence. The other is, Look at the world and try to gain a deeper understanding of the world. In the Bhagavatam, we have the Virata Rupa, the second canto of the Virata Rupa that is described. That is the example of, okay, what I'm seeing is real, but there is a deeper reality beyond this. So both these approaches, if you consider the extremes with respect to these approaches, is that there is Advaita, Advaita Vedanta in the broad Vedic tradition, which says that nothing about the material world is real. That every single thing that we are experiencing is simply false, is simply illusory. So nothing about the material world is real. That's one extreme. The other extreme is what was uh, Charvakism. Charvak was the uh, infamous materialistic philosopher in the Vedic tradition, uh, because in the Indian tradition broadly. And he holds that nothing except the material world is real. Everything else is false. He says, Swarga is false, Punar Janma is false, there is no next life, there is no next world. Therefore, just enjoy in this world. Now, of course, that is an oversimplification of Charvak's philosophy, but essentially it is true. So now, in between is broadly the Vedantic philosophy and specifically, we are looking at the Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy. That the Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy is, uh, there is, there are levels of reality. 
there is a spiritual reality there is a physical reality there is a mental reality there are various levels of reality and ultimately we are meant to ascend to the spiritual level of reality but the bhagavatam does not reject the reality of the material world this is just this is real because it has come from the lord and it is sustained by the lord so why are we discussing all this right now the point of discussing all this is to recognize what actually is going on in this whole discussion so within the, if we consider the, when how are there this such wide and almost contradictory systems of philosophy coming up because they all interpreted the vedic literature in different ways so indian philosophy can be said to have these two broad divisions there is what is called as the orthodox and then the other is heterodox so orthodox means that which those which accepted the vedas and these are six systems of philosophy the bhagavata mentions these in its first canto when in the chap- chapters 4 5 6 where vyasadev's despondency is described there so these are the six systems of philosophy which emerged and they all accept the vedas however what do the vedas actually teach the six systems of philosophy interpret them in different ways they interpret each philosophy in a particular way so they they take the same text but this text means this and this text brought together with this text means this so now there are of course there are some heterodox philosophies and these are jainism buddhism and charvakism now so, sometimes they are called as atheistic philosophies within the vedic tradition the word atheistic refers more to the rejection of the vedas astikyam refers more to accepting the vedas so nastikya refers to rejecting the vedas if you go to jain temples you will find there are many images over there they have appropriate many appropriated many of the hindu images but their idea is okay you want to ultimately attain the jain conception of moksha of liberation but to get toward that at an intermediate level you can worship all these devtas and then eventually you can attain moksha so what happens is all these all these schools of philosophy they take the vedic literature as the base but they interpret it in different ways so perhaps one of the most outrageous examples of such a uh, such interpretation or misinterpretation is the book called the jain ramayana so the jains they recognize that these books whether it is the vedas or the ramayana the mahabharat these books have enormous influence in india so we can't reject these books so what do we do we say yes these books tell a truth but the higher truth to which you can gradually go when you go go through these books and go beyond these books is the jain jain conception of enlightenment so in the jain ramayana more or less the story of the ramayana is the same but what they do is throughout his forest stay when ram meets various sages he is meeting jain sadhus not vedic sages but jain sages and they all give him instruction sadupdesh in the great truth of jainism and eventually when sita is taken by the earth at that time according to jain ramayana ram becomes renounced he becomes enlightened and then he becomes a jain he adopts jainism and that's how he attains enlightenment now this is a preposterous retelling and modern day jainism is quite celebrated or quite well known but as far as it is known for its non violence and its pacifism but still the principle remains that there were quite aggressive uh, aggressive philosophical debates and discussions that would happen and overall uh these philosophies had a huge amount of influence like jainism buddhism charvakism all three are atheistic mm-hmm. so they all wrote their own books which are quite strongly atheistic rejecting the vedas and rejecting the idea of god as ultimate reality krishna also mentions this uh, as a demoniac idea when he says anishwaram he says asatyam aptishtante jagad ahur anishwaram 
in 1608, he talks about this. So anyway, we don't want to go too much into this. The point we're discussing this is that the Bhagavatam gives us a truth that integrates and culminates the best thoughts within these various systems of thought. So it is the, it is the culmination. So now if you consider, now I, I don't want to go into these six systems of philosophy. Let's skip this for the timing. It's too technical. But so within these six systems of philosophy, one philosophy is Vedantic. And Vedantic philosophy is based on the Vedanta Sutra primarily. And Vedanta Sutra, it actually involves the idea that there is one ultimate reality which exists at the end of the Vedas. So it can refer to both literally and conceptually. Literally, at the end of the Vedas, there are the Upanishads. So Vedanta focuses a lot on the Upanishads. Even the Vedanta Sutra is actually an analysis of what do the Upanishads mean. So Vedanta, literally it means what exists at the end of the Veda, that Upanishad, what is its meaning? We're trying to explore that. We're developing our philosophy based on that. And conceptually, Veda means knowledge. So Vedanta in that sense means the summit of knowledge, the conclusion of knowledge. So the Vedanta says that the highest reality is Brahman. And now what is the nature of that Brahman? So the oneness without differentiation is the Advaitic idea. And oneness with differentiation is the personalist idea. So now we have the Bhagavatam, there are places where it seems to support Advaita Vata. And that's why Sridhar Swami has also commented on it. Sridhar Swami nominally belonged to Advaitic Sampradaya. But the point is that the Bhagavatam gives uh, a very deep and philosophical understanding which accepts the premise of Advaita, but then gives the conclusion that there is a personal divinity who is non-different from the world. So that we accept that there is oneness, but there is differentiation also. This is the this understanding is most thoroughly developed in the Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy. So now, so what, what is the point of, why are we talking about the Bhagavatam over here? So all these systems of philosophy were there and they had all their different teachings. And what happens is, all of these, not all of these were written primarily by Vyasadev, but they were developed based on the writings of Vyasadev. So Vyasadev, what happens is in the Vedas, he does give the ultimate reality, but the ultimate reality is not given as clearly as, as is not given so clearly that it can be easily understood. And that's why there is often a possibility for misinterpretation. And therefore what we have is Vyasadev's mature realization. The Bhagavatam depicts that he satisfied only with the ultimate reality and only with, not the ultimate reality, but only with pure glorification of that ultimate reality. Pure means only for the desire of that ultimate reality. Only for the desire of pleasing that ultimate reality, of loving that ultimate reality. Dharma projeta kaitavotra paramo nirmat saranam satam. I push aside dharma. Which is, which is kaitava, which teaches anything other than pure devotion to the ultimate reality. And that ultimate reality, the Bhagavatam will reveal in due course to be Krishna. So, as I said, we'll come, come to this over a period of time. We'll discuss more about the Bhagavatam as we talk about Prabhupada's presentation of the Bhagavatam. But the Bhagavatam also, it reveals divinity in progressive ways. So, in the second canto, we have the Virata Rupa in the second canto. And then we have, that is immanence. Immanence means God present within nature. So, God in material nature or God in material, material nature, you could say, that is a universal form. And to transcendence is God beyond material nature or ultimate reality beyond material nature. And that is described in the vision of Krishna in Vrindavan, beyond this material world. So, in this way, the Bhagavatam, it starts, like earlier I said that this point that we start with sensory perception and we go deeper. The other is that there is a world which is completely different from the world of sensory perception. 
and just seek that world. So the Bhagavatam integrates both these things. Now let's look at the preeminence of the Bhagavatam in the Gaudiya tradition. So now in the Gaudiya tradition, if we go, if we go into the history of the broad development of philosophy in the Indian Indian philosophy. So there were the, there was various acharyas who explained the comment, Vedanta Sutra in different ways. Shankaracharya explained in an Advaitic way. Then we have Ramacharya explained in a in a Vishishta Advaita way. So like that, there is a progression. So the Gaudiya tradition, among all the various traditions, the Gaudiya tradition considers the Bhagavatam the most important. Each tradition decides from one particular book that is important. So for Shankaracharya, it is not just one book, it is some sections of books. For him, the Mahavakyas are the most important. Then the, the Sri Sampradaya, they consider the Vishnu Purana to be the most important. In the Gaudiya Sampradaya, the Bhagavat Purana, the Srimad Bhagavatam is considered to be the most important. So now what specifically is in our tradition, the Bhagavatam so important? So the previous section I discussed briefly and we will come back to this again in future. But the point is that in the vast body of Vedic literature, the person from whose writings this whole vast body of literature came, that person remains discontented till he speaks the Bhagavatam. So therefore, the Bhagavatam is the mature fruit. Nigama Kalpataror Galitam Falam. Galitam Falam. It is the richly developed fruit that is being relished over here. Kalitam Falam. And that is what the Bhagavatam depicts. It is what the Bhagavatam relish, offers us for relishing. So that is the historical significance of the Bhagavatam. So any reflections or questions at this point? Is Param Satya the absolute truth or the highest truth? It can be both. When we say the highest truth, the highest truth is also absolute. But the absolute is, doesn't mean that everything else doesn't have reality. Because the Vedic understand, Bhagavatam's understanding rather is that the all of reality is a manifestation of the absolute truth. But there are two ways of looking at it. That we can say there is a hierarchy of reality. That there is a hierarchy of reality and then Krishna is the highest reality. So for example, we have the concept in the Bhag in the Bhakti Samad Sindhu of different living beings having, dif having different qualities. So the jivas exhibit 50 qualities with, uh, at the most Brahmaji, then 55 qualities is with Shiva, 60 qualities is with Vishnu and 64 is with Krishna. So here, from this perspective, what is happening is Krishna is having the high, is the highest reality. He's exhibiting the maximum qualities. So everybody has their reality, but Krishna is the highest reality. So in that sense, he is the absolute truth. But, uh, sorry, he is the highest reality. In that, in a hierarchy of reality, he is the highest reality. And then, on the other hand, um, so what differentiates these levels? That is how much of the highest reality is manifested. So we jivas also manifest Krishna, but we are parts of Krishna. We are fragmental parts of Krishna. So Krishna's infinitude is manifested very fractionally through us. So that's how uh, we are you could say finite reality. He is the infinite reality. Now, the other approach is that there is absolute reality means when Hiranyakashipu asks Prahlad, what is the source of your strength? What is the source of your strength? So what is replied over there? Now, Prahlad is not just being cheeky when he is replying that the source of your source of my strength is the source of your strength and is the source of the source of your strength also. That means that he is the source of the strength of Brahma. Your strength is not your own strength, uh, but he is a, it is the strength of, um, it is coming from Vishnu, it is coming from that Supreme Lord. And in that sense, that is the absolute truth. So let's put it this way. Param Satya, when you talk about it, the highest truth is God, God is the best of all beings. 
and absolute truth means god is the basis of all being all being being means existence that nothing can exist without him so both are real both are real that in if we consider living beings to be a hierarchy and god exists at the highest level but that doesn't mean that other living beings can gradually climb up and they can display replace god so god is the best of all beings means that say uh, it's it's if we have a the atp the tennis champion the tennis ranking systems are there and there is one player who is number 1 in the world and there are others who are 2 3 that can go to 1000 10000 whatever now this top player is at the top but others if they improve and they defeat the person at the top they can go to the top so is god the best of all beings he is yes but is that all he is no actually he is at the top of all beings and it's like all other people who have other abilities they get their ability from him therefore none of them can displace displace him none of them can replace him so that is god is the basis of all being the best of all beings and he is the basis of all being so <clears throat> i hope that addresses the question okay there are a lot of questions here now uh what are the shat sandarbhas in relationship with the bhagavatam see it's a little complicated but let me try to explain over here okay so what what happened is that the in our tradition okay let's let i'll answer this question a little later when we come let me go to the gaudiya gaudiya vaishnava tradition a little bit and then i'll come to shat sandarbhas okay so they explain the bhagavatam but i'll explain that in due course give me a few minutes then what is the other question hmm is ramanuja chare they consider vishnu puran the ultimate and natural they consider vaikuntha to be the ultimate in the gaudiya tradition they can it's a golok rindavan that is considered to be the ultimate how does inanimate or non moving relate to the absolute truth everything is the emanation of the absolute truth everything comes from the supreme lord aham evasam evagre nanyat satatparam that the, the, in the beginning i alone existed now in the middle i alone exist in the end also i alone will exist so all of these things to be coming from krishna so all of reality does emanate from krishna then now why do different sampradayas they disapprove of this well they don't disapprove of this they also worship krishna but they they read the scriptures differently so scriptures can be understood in different ways and there are differences of rasa and those differences of rasa don't have to be exaggerated in order definitely whether somebody worships vishnu or krishna or narayan or uh, narsimha they can still become liberated they can still still obtain the ultimate truth so uh, i think at this place uh, we don't have to differentiate we don't have to get into technicalities or differences the difference is not in terms of tattva you know other form vishnu murtis are also capable of giving liberation it's just the intimacy of the relationship is more within krishna so it is important for us to know when to emphasize that krishna and vishnu are non different and when to emphasize that krishna and vishnu are different so if somebody is based on the bhagavad gita and the bhagavatam is a vaishnava is practicing bhakti and but they are practicing bhakti in a devoted way to directed towards some deity other than krishna towards some form of vishnu then that is not a issue that has to be made into a big thing it depends on the disposition of the person in chaitanya leela we have a chaitanya mahaprabhu is going to south india at that time there is this ram bhakta is constantly chanting the names of ram he is agonized 
that Ra- Sita has been abducted away from Ram. And Lord Chaitanya, the two devotees actually like that. And by association with Lord Chaitanya, both of them become devotees of Krishna. On the other hand, in the same Chaitanya Charita Amrit, there is Lord. Uh, there is there are two associates of Lord Chaitanya. Uh, there is one lesser known associate, Anupam, the, who is the one of the brothers of Rupa and Sanatan Goswami. And then there is Murari Gupta, who is quite a prominent associate and whose biography, whose karchas, are the basis of all the biographies of Lord Chaitanya. So both of them were great devotees of Lord Ram, and Lord Chaitanya celebrated their devotion to Ram. He delighted in their devotion to Ram. He glorified Murari Gupta. So firm is your devotion. So we don't have to uh, emphasize the difference too much. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not get into a debate with his uh, with Murari Gupta uh, about why are you worshiping this. There are matters of the heart, and we need to recognize that rasa is a very important reality. Of course, we will see that subtle difference is still there that. Within the Gaudiya tradition, we have the Advaita Parivar, we have the Nityananda Parivar, we have the Gadadhar Parivar. So they are all initiating gurus. But within the Gaudiya Sampradaya, Murari Gupta is not an initiating guru. Why? Because the Gaudiya Sampradaya focuses on uh, worshipping Krishna as the ultimate Aradhya Dev. Aradhyo Bhagavan Brajesh Tanayas Taddhama Vrindavanam We worship Krishna and Vrindavan. So Murari Gupta is worshipping Kram so his, his devotion is accepted. His, his uh, devotion to Lord Chaitanya is also valued. His biographies are valued. But he doesn't become initiating guru in our tradition. Samambonam simply means that which is the ultimate good, that which is the highest reality. Okay. That which is the highest reality. Bon, bonam usually refers to good and samam means the highest. So I'll come back to the Sandarbha soon. And so Preeminence or prominence of the Bhagavatam in the Gaudiya tradition. So it is described in the Gaudiya tradition. It is Sarva Pramana Chakravarti Bhuta. Yuga Swami uses this word. That what is the Bhagavatam's position? It is the emperor of the, all the Pramanas. There are various Pramanas. And among them, the Bhagavatam is the highest. Now it's an elaborate analysis he gives. Why Bhagavatam is the highest? In fact, he used four different strands of analysis to explain why the Bhagavatam is the highest. And one, one strand of analysis, of course, it is spoken by Vyasadeva in his maturity. After he has written all the other literature, then he is writing the ultimate literature. That is one reason. Another is that he this is spoken to a person who is about to die. When people are in the world, they have various desires and they pursue various things. But when they are about to die, at that time, the most important thing is what is valued. So, you um, could put it. Why the preeminence of the Bhagavatam? So, if you want to talk about it. Um, so, one is that we ask Deus mature realization. The other is that focuses on handling, on dealing with life's ultimate reality. Different people may have different ideas of what is ultimate reality, but one real ultimate reality nobody can deny is death. So it focuses directly on that. Then it starts with universal questions about human welfare. It doesn't start, if you see the sages of the, the questions of the sages in the Bhagavatam, but for example, the Shiva Puran, there are many other Puranas, they start with, please describe the glories of Shiva, please glorify the glories of this particular Devata, please glorify the glories of this person. But the Bhagavatam starts with, if you consider one start is, what is the duty of a person about to die? The other start is that with Sutta Goswami speaking, uh, as un, in answer to the question of the sages, at Nemi Sharanya. Uh, uh, and what are those questions? Those questions are about universal welfare. And what is the ultimate good Shreya, Shreya Sparam of, for the living beings? What is it that, especially in this dark age of Kali, will benefit people? So he gives various frames for explaining why the Bhagavatam is the highest. Now, 
the pro- important thing is within the vedic tradition in the within the gaudiya vishnu tradition chaitanya mahaprabhu considered mm, chaitanya mahaprabhu considered the bhagavatam to be the most important book now why the most important book because of various reasons one reason being that it focuses on on the importance of devotion to krishna and we'll we'll understand that in the more better in terms of the uh, the understanding of the gaudiya tradition so let's come to that mm-hmm. sorry yeah so now in one sense why is the gaudiya tradition focusing on on the bhagavatam because in the bhagavatam there is the maximum description most detailed and most devotional description of krishna lila is there there are other other books also other puranas also which talk of krishna lila the mahabharata also describes krishna's past times but the mahabharata focuses more on the the activities of the pandavas and within those activities there is also a description of the activities of of krishna as he assists them but in the bhagavatam the focus is singularly on krishna that krishna lila is described in the bhagavatam the most the longest philosophical section in the bhagavatam is arguably the uddhav gita the uddhav gita is krishna shiksha so both of them are there over here and it's very special and very sacred so in this way the singular focus on the bhagavatam on uh, in the bhagavatam on krishna and then what happens is uh, so the gaudiya tradition it is focused on worshiping krishna and krishna pervades the bhagavatam there is uh, from the first canto till the 12th canto the names of krishna the remembrance of krishna the past times of krishna they are at least hinted at they are described if not if not directly described but at least indirectly pointed to there are references there throughout and in fact in the first canto there is a detailed prelude if we consider from 1.7 to 1.16 we have seven ten chapters which largely are describe krishna lila of course in the that there's a chapter about vidura instruct in the trashtra and the trashtra renunciation their parikshit's birth but they are all in the background they are they are all going on in the background with krishna being present on the planet and krishna going here krishna going there krishna interacting with the devotees so there is a detailed prelude so just like if you have a trailer of a movie that in the trailer the idea is the best part of the movie is given so that people will watch the full movie so in the first canto the trailer of krishna's endearing past times are given so that uh, people are attracted to watch the full movie to read the full bhagavatam and they come to the 10th canto so now in the in the bhagavatam we find there's a vivid description of krishna in vrindavan and especially we have the rasa panchadhyay and the rasa panchadhyay is considered to be the five chapters of the ras lila in the bhagavatam this is 10th canto 29 to 33 chapters and this is considered the heart of the bhagavatam and huge amount of poetry and poetry and literature and a whole vibrant tradition of living devotion has sprung around the ras panchadhyay and the ras panchadhyay talks about the glory of the gopis uh, uh, of the gopis love for krishna and it points it hints at the love of the love of the brajivas uh, love of radharani for krishna so it's pointed out so now so this is what is described in the bhagavatam now the gaudiya tradition what does the gaudiya tradition mean so gaudiya in an external or esoteric sense exoteric sense it refers to the geographical area where the tradition emerged that's the gaudiya desh so it appeared in gaudiya gaudiya desh that's why it's called gaudiya tradition but but now we may say the gaudiya tradition has spread far over the all across the world it is not just in the gaudiya desh so is the name gaudiya appropriate to actually so the gaudiya tradition also refers gaudiya is a variant of the word gud gud means sweet so in different words can be derived derived in different ways so gaudiya can be a variant of gaud where it refers to a geographical area gaudiya can also be a variant of gud 
गुड मीन्स जैगरी सो जैगरी इज अवेलेबल इन वेरियस पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड वेरियस पार्ट ऑफ इंडिया बट इज डिस्क्राइब द जैगरी इन द जैगरी इन बेंगाल इज कंसिडर टू बी एस्पेशली स्वीट and if any of you have been to mayapur and if you have purchased the jaggery over there it's it's extraordinary it's like chocolate so similarly bhakti is widespread bhakti is not just in the vaishnav tradition but actually all over the world there is the there are expressions of devotion toward god in various theistic traditions but the special sweetness of devotion is manifested by radha rani in her relationship with krishna in her remembrance of krishna while she is separated from him and in that sense that is the supreme manifestation of devotion so it is this devotion that is special so gaudiya refers to the sweetness of the devotion of radha rani for krishna that is revealed by lord chaitanya anarpita charim chirat karunaya avtirna kalo that that which is not given for a very very long time is now being described anarpita charim chirat so now what is happening is the bhagavatam points to the devotion of radha rani toward krishna and now our topic is we appreciate the bhagavatam and then we appreciate how prabhupada has presented the bhagavatam to us so the bhagavatam it describes radha rani's devotion for krishna and what is radha rani's devotion that she is the person who has pleased krishna the most therefore when krishna leaves all the gopis he stays with her so her devotion is completely selfless completely selfless means actually she gets nothing in return for her devotion in fact not even the status of his name or his association see generally speaking when we do something for someone we expect something in return from them so the gopis offer themselves to krishna and among them radha rani offers herself the most to krishna now they don't become his wedded wives so they don't get his name and okay even if they don't get his name at least they can meet krishna even if secretly but no they can't even do that because krishna leaves vrindavan and goes away so so here it is demonstrated that you know in one sense you get nothing in return for your devotion still you maintain your devotion that is the greatness of devotion of course it's not that they don't get anything because they're offering themselves to krishna krishna is manifesting himself in their hearts like in no one else's heart so they do get that reciprocation internally but externally it is as if they get nothing so dharma projeta kaita votra that desiring to love krishna so that he will give us something something to us in return that is not the mood of the bhagavatam that is not at all the mood of radharani's devotion so it is not immoral it is see there is dharma and there is para dharma so many people will mistake para dharma to be adharma that which is above normal morality that which is trans moral some people will mistake it to be immoral so they may think it is below dharma so immoral means that one doesn't have moral strength that means when temptations come that person succumbs to those temptations that's immoral but trans moral means that one follows a morality that transcends normal virtues that transcends virtue that is trans moral that is radha rani's devotion for krishna so now in the gaudiya vaishnav tradition what is happening is that the centrality of bhakti to krishna in the mood of radha rani so in every school there may be many different aspects of the philosophy but there is there are two common things there is path and there is purpose so there is path and purpose so sadhan this is you could say this is path sadhan and then we have purpose purpose is what is it to be achieved so the purpose is krishna the, that is sadhya and the path is the sadhan is bhakti and specifically we seek for bhakti in the mood of shrimati radha rani so now this brings us to the answer to the earlier question which we're going to be raised that um, in the gaudiya vaishnav tradition so what is this in the vedic tradition you could imagine there a very vast body of knowledge is there 
So it's like a vast mine. And in the mine, you have the most precious jewel that is there. That most precious jewel is the Bhagavatam. If you consider the Vedic literature to be like a vast mine, the Bhagavatam is the precious jewel within that. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has descended to show us, see when jewel is found in the earth, it is not shining. It has, maybe different people may mistake it to be different things. So now it's not that somebody has to do anything to the jewel, to the precious stone. The precious stone has its natural effulgence. It just has to be revealed. So what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said is that the Vedanta Sutra is giving that truth which is more presented more explicitly in Srimad Bhagavatam. That which is hidden in the Vedanta Sutra, that which is not clear in the Vedanta Sutra, that is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Now he called it the natural commentary. Why the natural commentary? Because it is given by the same author in the in his maturity. So Sarva Shastra Chiromani I mentioned earlier. Now with this context, let's come back to the question about Sandarbhas. So see when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described the he said this is natural commentary. The challenge was that would everyone accept that? You see, in different traditions, there are different sources of authority. And the same authority is not going to be accepted by everyone. So, so natural commentary. So, what does natural commentary mean? It means, say, suppose, say a dense class given on one day and then same topic explained more accessibly the next day. So for example, a dense here means a very complicated class. Somebody gives a talk and in that talk, they take a lot of concepts and then the audience says, you know, okay, well, what you spoke yesterday, we didn't really understand it. Can you make it a little, a little more understandable? Sure, I'll do that. Now, when the next day they give a class, it is not that, okay, yesterday I made this one statement and this is what this statement means. This is what this statement means. They're not going to go sentence by sentence on the class that they gave on the previous day and then explain each sentence. So they'll just approach the subject in a different way. And they approach the subject in a different way that is more accessible. So, Natural commentary is not equal to literal commentary. Literal commentary means what? That the not that each sentence from previous class is elaborated. So because the Bhagavatam is a natural commentary, not a literal commentary. Literal commentary means what? Say, for example, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita commentary is there. So there is the Bhagavad Gita verse. And for each verse, Prabhupada is given an explanation. That is a literal commentary. So when the natural commentary is said to be there, then the question comes up. Okay, you are saying that, okay, this, this book, the Bhagavatam is the commentary, natural commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. So, but then the question comes up, the Bhagavatam's teachings seem to be quite different from the teachings of the Vedanta Sutra. The Vedanta Sutra focuses primarily on Brahman and the Bhagavatam clearly focuses on Krishna. So, how exactly is this the natural commentary? So, so not everybody accepted that authority. So, because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had said that there is no need for a commentary, now, those who, are, those who are his followers, they will accept his authority. But you cannot expect those who are not his followers to accept that authority. So, for example, say if we are going to... So, here we could put, say... Persuasion requires acceptance of shared authority. 
So what does this mean? That if I am going to persuade you about something, or you are going to persuade me about something, so we both need to accept some authority. So unless both of us share some authority, say currently certain political upheavals have happened in Afghanistan. Now what do they mean for us? What is the danger for us immediately? So I may feel that it is a big danger. Some you may feel that there's not a big danger, but these are just our opinions. So what do we base it? Now are there some sources? Maybe some devotees who are learned in this field, some people who are accomplished, who are well versed in contemporary affairs as well as in dharm as dharmic truths. They are authority. So then we refer to them, and then okay, this is what this is what I thought is what I thought. This is the authority. So if two people don't accept any authority shared. then there is no way for discussion to happen so you know if say somebody is if there is a christian and a muslim they are talking and the christian quotes the bible and the muslim quotes the quran and if that is what they are going to do then there is no discussion going to happen because i am just going to quote my book and i don't accept the authority of your book and you don't accept the authority of my book there has to be some acceptance of shared authority so for example if we are if we are speaking to scientifically minded people and we are going to talk about the um, explaining the concept of the soul to scientifically minded people so if you are going to do that can we just quote gita and prabhupad the gita says that the, that actually the body is not our essential identity the soul is and that's what prabhupad says now that will not work you say oh that is just your religious text saying that so then if for them their authority no this won't work now maybe afterwards they develop faith then that may work for them but maybe here we will need scientific research scientific researchers who talk about past life memories who talk about near death experiences who talk about hmm, how life and consciousness can't be explained in terms of the materialistic framework so when that person accepts scientist's authority accepts science's authority and we share okay let's see what science is saying then there is some communication possible there is some persuasion possible so what happened is for the, the goswamis they faced a significant challenge chaitanya mahaprabhu said that bhagavatam is a natural commentary on the vedanta sutra but those who did not accept chaitanya mahaprabhu authority how are they going to accept his conclusion so how are they going to accept his conclusion they will not and because chaitanya mahaprabhu had said that there is no need to write um to there is no need to write a commentary on the bhagavatam so they couldn't write a commentary also so what do they do at that time that became a challenge for them they couldn't write a commentary on the vedanta sutra not bhagavatam now why was a commentary on vedanta sutra needed because at that time why commentary on vedanta sutra because the vedanta sutra is a part of the prasthana tray that every tradition had to establish its credentials by writing a commentary a vedanta sutra commentary that's how our tradition sorry, that yes this is our authority this is this is how we understand the vedanta sutra so but when go the goswamis could not do that so what did the goswamis do especially jiv goswami he does something quite brilliant now of course sandarbhas do many many things but what he is doing in part of the sandarbhas is that he is taking select sandarbha means thread so there are different meanings of the word sandarbha also but let's take the meaning of thread over here to understand this he takes selects verses from bhagavatam that that explain themes from vedanta sutra so for example there is chatushuti tika chatushuti tika is what chatushuti uh, so he is taking the first first four sutras 
फर्स्ट फोर वेदांत सूत्र अथा तो ब्रह्म जिज्ञासा जन्मादि शास्त्र योणित एंड पत्तु समन्वया एंड ही ही शोज हाउ भागवतम वर्सेस कैन एक्सप्लेन दिस फोर सूत्र एंड सिमिलरली विधान सूत्र कैन एक्सप्लेन कैन बी एक्सप्लेन यूजिंग द भागवतम सो देन व्हाट ही डज इज ही सिलेक्ट भागवतम वर्सेस एंड बिल्ड्स अप अ होल यूजिंग सिलेक्टेड भागवतम वर्सेस और यू कुड सी कुड से सिस्टमैटिकली सिलेक्टेड सिस्टमैटिकली सिलेक्टेड और सिस्टमैटिकली अरेंज्ड भागवतम वर्सेस he establishes the foundational truths of gaudiya vaishnavism so that's how the the vedan sutra is basically like a uh, basically uh, taking the verses of the bhagavatam as threads and using sometimes we can use threads and with the threads we can make a beautiful design so तत्व संदर्भ दर इज कृष्ण संदर्भ दर इज प्रीति संदर्भ दर इज भक्ति संदर्भ लाइक दैट देर आर वेरियस संदर्भ एंड ईच ऑफ दोज वन वन कोर ट्रूथ ऑफ द गौड़िया वैष्णव ट्रेडिशन ही इज वीविंग इट एंड ही इज मेकिंग दैट ब्यूटिफुल पैटर्न एंड इज एक्सप्लेनिंग इट सो ही हैड टू डू दैट बिकॉज ही हैड टू एस्टैब्लिश द क्रेडेंशियल्स ऑफ द टू थिंग्स ही हैड टू एस्टैब्लिश द क्रेडेंशियल्स ऑफ द गौड़िया ट्रेडिशन for those who are vedantic followers and secondly he had to establish the credentials of the vedic tradition of the gaudiya tradition as being naturally derived from the bhagavatam so he did both those things and thus he brought credentials for the for the he brought respectability in the intellectual and spiritual elites of the time for the gaudiya tradition okay so did devotees go against tor chaitanya mahaprabhu writing the writing the sutra commentary uh, vedanta sutra commentary well that is a, a important example of how sometimes niyamagraha can destroy a tradition so what had happened was all the satsandarbha sandarbhas were written in the 16th century roughly mm. they were written in 16th century but by the time of the 17th century things had changed substantially and in the court of jaipur vrindavan vrindavan was still the headquarters of devotion but vrindavan had been devastated by the muslims so vrindavan was in one sense the spiritual headquarters but the functional headquarters was jaipur because the jaipur king was a prominent patron of gaudiya of of vaishnavas in general and um, of gaudiya vaishnavas in particular so what happened is there um, before which govind ji got brought from vrindavan to jaipur there was a ramanand sampraday and ramanand sampraday's followers they worshiped lord ram and ram was the prominent deity of the kingdom and when govind ji came and govind ji's beauty won the heart of the participants won the heart of the of the king and his royal family then they all started uh, building a beautiful temple for uh, lord Go- for govind ji and they started worshiping him and in one sense all the patronage shifted from uh, a significant amount of patronage shifted to gaudiya vaishnavism so the ramanandis became enraged by that and they decided that how do we how do we get the win the king back to us so they decided that we will falsify the credentials of gaudiya vaishnav itself so they said this gaudiya vaishnav this is not a bona fide tradition at all why because because you don't have any commentary on the vedanta sutra there it's a very complicated uh, whatever whatever the challenges were there there were many challenges they said where is the basis for 
saying that Krishna is supreme instead of Vishnu. Where is the basis for worshipping Radharani with Krishna and not Rukmini with Krishna? Because Krishna is married to Rukmini and not to Radha. And what is the basis for, for yourself, calling yourself a Sampradaya also? So, so at that time, Baldev Vidya Bhushan realized, he was sent by Vishnu Chikatakur, and he realized that that unless he wrote a commentary, Gaudiya Vaishnavism itself would be rejected. Now, according to some later Gaudiya Vaishnavas, it is said that Baldev Vidya Bhushan is the, uh, is the reincarnation of Sarvam Bhattacharya. And Sarvam Bhattacharya heard Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's explanation of Vedanta Sutra. Hmm. And Baldev Vidya Bhushan came back to that. Uh, Baldev Vidya Bhushan uh, when he came back as Baldev Devashan, he explained it. Now, some people say that, no, there was another attendant who heard Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explain Sarvam Bhattacharya and that attendant came back as Baldev Devashan. And of course, there are others who say that, no, Baldev Devashan is himself a different eternal associate and he came uh, afterwards. But the point is that Niyamagraha, if there are Niyamagraha means sticking to the, sticking to the letter of the law at the cost of the spirit of the law. So that is un undesirable. Um, so we need to understand what is the purpose of this law? So what is the purpose of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saying that the Bhagavatam is a natural commentary? It was not to ban writing commentaries on the Vidhan Sutra. It was to establish the glory of the Bhagavatam. But when the whole parampara, which was, which was actually glorifying the Bhagavatam, which was based on the Bhagavatam, that whole tradition it was, itself was being challenged. Then sometimes the disciple or the follower has to fulfill the mission of the teacher by doing something different from what the teacher is told. So there is no evidence that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explicitly forbade so he didn't say, never write a commentary on the Sutra. He says, there is no need for a commentary. But later, a need came up. So if a need came up, what do you do? So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said it was redundant at his times. But later time, it is not redundant. So we can't take the words literally. So we have to understand the purpose of the words and then honor the purpose, fulfill the purpose of the words appropriately. Yes, correct. A good example of Gorkisha as Babaji's disciples dragging, wanting to drag his body through when, after his disappearance. So the story is that he said that after I die, I want my body to be bathed. Um, in the dust of in the uh, dust of the dham. So some of his followers wanted to. Some of the followers wanted to actually do it physically. And he said, no, that is a mood. That is a bhav. Don't drag it like that. Okay. Now, in as devotees, is it important to study the Sandarbhas? Why not? It is our tradition's literature. It is our tradition's quite important literature. And yes, we can learn, appreciate the scholarship of, of Gaudiya, of Jiva Goswami. We can understand, we can get a better, much deeper appreciation of the Bhagavatam. So it's wonderful to study the Sandarbhas. Now, is it essential? It depends on our particular service. Mm. So if we are preaching to people who accept the authority of the Bhagavatam, but they have different understandings of what the Bhagavatam teaches. Then, to clarify the understanding of the Bhagavatam, studying of the Sandarbhas is extremely helpful. However, if we are, are primarily reaching out to people who don't accept any scriptural authority of any scripture at all, and our primary service is to help them appreciate the need of scripture and gradually come to accept the authority of scripture, then we need to focus on those, on learning those teachings or learning those, uh, um, learning that aspect of the philosophy 
uh, which can help people develop that faith, which can help people come to the study of scripture. So different devotees may be differently inspired. So one could be if somebody, we ourselves feel very attracted, nourished by a particular book, then we can read that book and be nourished by that. Another is, it is our personal inspiration. The other second is our service requirement. If our service requires that, we can read that. So it depends. And uh, the Bhagavatam itself is very vast. And reading that itself also takes a good amount of time. So that's the Sandarbhas. Now, now, how can we know in our lives what the spirit and what the letter of the law? That's Mm, that is, as is mentioned, niyam agraha. That niyam agna is not niyam agraha. That is niyam agraha. Niyam agraha means agraha is not accepting at all. It's rejecting the rule. But niyam agraha is insisting on the rule. So that requires actually a deeper understanding of what is it that the acharyas want to do. What is it that is the purpose of the Acharyas? What is the purpose of the author of the book? So, so for example, the fifth canto cosmology in the Bhagavatam. Hmm? Now, Parikshit Maharaj is about to depart from the world. So, when he is about to depart from the world, at that time, Parikshit Maharaj's purpose is not to get a PhD in cosmology. Parishit Maharaj's purpose is to see how through the understanding of the cosmos, his remembrance of the Lord can be increased. And the Bhagavatam also says that is the purpose. So if somebody takes uh, the literal word of the Bhagavatam's description of cosmology and puts that in conflict with modern cosmology, then what are we doing? We are doing Niyamagra. That the Bhagavatam is for a different purpose. The modern science is for a different purpose. So we have to keep the purpose in mind clearly. So when we put science and scripture, when we put scripture and science in competition with each other, we end up devaluing scripture and we end up devaluing science also. Science is primarily meant to help us function in this world. Scripture also can help us function in the world, but it's primarily meant to help us get out of this world. So both of them have their own domains. So if we put science and scripture in competition, we are devaluing scripture. Scripture can give us something which science can't do. No amount of the best medical science can grant immortality, can grant eternal existence, can grant love for Krishna. So now scripture may also contain some material knowledge and material science can also have some spiritual pointers and that overlapping areas can be addressed. But that's why focusing on the purpose is very important. The more we understand the purpose, then specific statements, specific uh, quotes, they can be they can be addressed appropriately. Okay. So, any other reflections or questions? So now let's move to. Let's move to what Prabhupada's, um, Prabhupada's presentation of the Bhagavatam. As I said, when I come to this, we'll be discussing some of it today and we'll come back to this point once again. So, now we know, okay, so the screen is not being shared here. Okay.
So the many questions here, let us see what we can take. After coming to the Krishna consciousness movement, we understand um, the highest philosophy. Then why do devotees sometimes go to other sampradayas? Well, there are many reasons. First reason is that just saying that we have the highest philosophy is not enough. We need to actually be able to establish how it is the highest philosophy. So if some devotees have that particular need, then they need to, have, within our moment, we need to have uh, those kind of, they need to be in, interact with those scholars who can actually explain that, um, okay, this is what this philosophy is based on. This is what this is teaching. This is what its conclusion is. And this is what this philosophy is teaching. So simply saying this is the highest philosophy, that is not particularly persuasive. Everybody can blow their own trumpet like that. So we need to actually connect devotees, those devotees who have questions like this with devotee scholars who can address their intellectual concerns if their concerns are actually intellectual. But sometimes when devotees may go to other groups, other traditions or whatever, it may not be because of the philosophy alone. It may just be because... Uh, they may have had bad experience with this is with devotees. They may find that devotees are too judgmental, too fanatical. They may have some problems with the institution and they may feel that I want a less institutionalized form of spirituality. So it's quite rare that a person leaves Krishna consciousness because of the philosophy, but because they find some better philosophy somewhere. Now people may claim that I left because I found the philosophy unsatisfactory. But if you actually discuss with them, there are some other grievances over there. So if those grievances could be addressed, then people may not go away. And even after that, the soul always has free will. So there is the mind, the soul is surrounded by the subtle body. There's the mind and the intelligence. And the mind can distract by giving rise to desires and the intelligence can distract by giving rise to doubts. So the soul has free will and that free will can be misdirected both by desires coming from the mind and by doubts coming from the intelligence. And either way, if the soul chooses to go along with those, then Krishna doesn't stop that. Krishna may give guidance, but if a person wants to go in a particular direction, follow a particular desire or follow a particular doubt, Krishna is not going to forcibly stop them. That is not who Krishna is. Krishna gives us free will. So free will doesn't just mean free will to follow our desires. It also means free will to follow our doubts. So just because somebody has the, we can say bhakti offers the highest happiness, then why do people still go towards worldly desires? Although those pleasures are lower. Well, there could be various reasons, but ultimately it's free will. So we can compare it with desires. Now, maybe Bhakti offers the highest happiness, but they were not provided proper resources so that they could experience any higher happiness. Maybe they were surrounded with uh, people who, who they were in a devotional atmosphere where they ex hardly experience any higher taste. Oh. So rather than saying that bhakti offers the higher taste, it is the responsibility of the, of the leaders of the movement to create an atmosphere where that higher taste can be experienced. Prabhupada says that the deities need to be decorated in such a way that when people lose minds are agitated and they come to the temple and behold the deities, they feel peaceful. So just as uh, some, if the higher taste is not made accessible, then people may not feel that higher taste and they may go away because some other taste seems better. The highest philosophy is not made accessible. Then people may go away. So the soul's free will is always there and we need to recognize that it is both the individual's responsibility to use the free will properly and it is also the leaders or the institutions, institutions leaders' responsibility to provide as many facilities as possible 
for that soul to use the free will properly. To be inspired to use the free will properly. Okay, now... So what are the other questions? Mm -hmm. Now, Radharani, there are a lot of questions here. I think we'll have to move ahead. Let's take one or two questions and then we can move ahead. So Radharani cannot survive without Krishna's service and he gets topmost happiness. I think it should be she over here. So Radharani cannot survive without Krishna's happiness, she gets topmost happiness, which seems greater than Krishna's happiness. So how is it selfless? So there is a difference between uh, happiness as the purpose of service and happiness as the result of service. So or that means uh, Radharani doesn't serve Krishna so that she will get happiness. Radharani serves Krishna because Krishna is so lovable and because she loves Krishna so much. Now, because Krishna is Sarva Sukhasagar, uh, is, he's, the, he's the ocean of all happiness, when, when her consciousness connects with Krishna through her remembrance and through her service, she naturally gets happiness. But her concern is not to be happy. So it is selfless now, selfless doesn't have to mean joyless. Selfless doesn't have to mean that it has to be joyless. Selfless means that joy, one's own pleasure, one's own joy, is not the purpose for doing that service. Now, and it's not that Krishna wants us to be miserable in our service to him. No, that is not at all what Krishna wants. Krishna wants each one of us to be happy. He wants us to be joyful. It's just that he wants each one of us to find higher happiness and thereby give up lower pleasures. So how do we do that? For that, sometimes we have to be selfless. So selfless actually means that what the self thinks right now to be the highest, well, this is not actually the highest. There is something higher. And that is what I am pursuing in my life. That is what I wish to seek. So, in that sense, this Radharani does get the highest happiness, but she's not seeking that. And that's why it's considered selfless. So... Bhagavatam is for a person who is about to die and Ramayana and Mahabharata are for other purposes. So if we take guidance from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, will we not be prepared at the time of death? Well, so this is creating unnecessary polarities. Unnecessary polarities means that um, no, that it has to be A or B. It is digital logic. So like when the, when the former US president launched this war against terror, after uh, he said that if you are not fighting against terror, then you are fighting. If you're not fighting the war against terror, then you are fighting the war for terror. That's a false polarity. There could be many, there were many th thoughtful people. They said, yes, terror has to be opposed. Terrorism has to be opposed. But is war the best way to oppose terrorism? Is the war the best way to control terrorism? So, so there are creating artificial polarities is unnecessary. So yes, we want to remember Krishna at the time of death. Uh, and we can use all the resources possible. Right now we are having the class in English right now. So we all learnt English 
and that's why we are able to understand this class i am able to speak you are able to understand the class so because we learn english does that mean that uh, we wasted that much time and instead we could have simply studied bhagavatam and we could have remembered the bhagavatam well no we can use the knowledge of the language and what is the purpose of using that knowledge of the language so the purpose is ultimately to use it to serve krishna to remember krishna so a devotee study the bhagavatam and the, the mahabharata and the ramayana but what do we study in the mahabharata and the ramayana we study do we focus on those principles in the ramayana and the mahabharata that assist us in our devotion so the mahabharata has many different teachings especially because the mahabharata is far bigger than the ramayana so as devotees we are not interested in every single teaching of the mahabharata for that matter as devotees we are not even interested in every single teaching of the bhagavatam the bhagavatam has so many descriptions of payavrata and things like that as devotees you know we, we are not doing the payavrata so yes we can study the books and the books have a lot of wisdom and they, they give us practical guidance for living so yes we want to prepare for death but we may die today but we may not die today also so if you are not going to die today then we have to prepare for our life as you are going to live so we can say that all these all these books all these sacred books they are resources for us to to deepen our devotion to deepen our convictions to get more and more guidance by which we can ultimately ultimately attain the attain life's supreme purpose so chaitanya if we see look at all the followers of lord chaitanya they all knew that they all knew that they all knew the vedic scriptures and we see that nitan prabhu and chaitanya mahaprabhu in the childhood they would enact lord ram's past times so they knew about ram leela and chaitanya mahap they all quoted many other scriptures and they knew actually it seems chaitanya charitamrit in the in chaitanya charitamrit krishna das karaj go swami quotes from something like 50 very around 50 different books so he is writing a book and he's primarily quoting from the bhagavatam but he's quoting from many other books also so they are all being used to glorify lord chaitanya glorify lord krishna so there's no need to create artificial polarity like this yes if somebody gets too caught in the details study of the mahabharat and gets into the technicalities of specific practices at specific times and then that they get caught in that and then they go they diverted from the remembrance of krishna then it could be a problem but these are books from our own tradition they may not be from the gaudiya tradition but the gaudiya tradition is a part of a broader tradition so why not enrich ourselves with the wisdom of these books so prabhupad said that sanyas is a must how do we get the spirit of these rules well in general prabhupad was not a person who nuanced his his speech when prabhupad was explaining one point he would go all the way and emphasize that point when prabhupad wanted to explain another point he would go all the way and explain that point so that's why we need to look at the broad body of prabhupad's literature prabhupad's literary contributions i am a part of the shastra advisory council and under the gbc's uh, the gbc request we prepared a, a whole um, whole uh, paper on hermeneutics and there is a course on hermeneutics that is also available hermeneutics basically means <clears throat> understanding shastra how do we understand shastra how do we understand prabhupad's words so one principle over there is don't just take one statement in isolation if you want to understand one position of prabhupad look at all that prabhupad has said on this point about it so um, prabhupad says if somebody is troubled by sex desire then then my standing instruction to all my disciples is that they should get married another place prabhupad says that if you are troubled by sex desire marriage is no solution now everybody is troubled by sex desire and even if you get married still you will be troubled 
So you have to learn to tolerate. So it seems Prabhupada is giving two opposite instructions. It depends on context. So we need to really recognize the context. So Prabhupada says sannyas is a must. Well, okay. You have to look at what context he, context he has said it. Did he insist that every single disciple of his has to take sannyas? Did he condemn those of his god brothers who hadn't taken sannyas? Did he condemn all the sages in the past who, not just kings, but even sages? Uh, sages, many of the sages didn't take sannyas. They had, their, they had their wives and they departed to the higher abodes with their wives. So, <clears throat> Prabhupada said we have to, sannyas is a must. But then Prabhupada also taught for the scripture that it is generally the Brahmanas who take sannyas. The Pandavas, they retired from the world. They retired from the world, but they didn't take, so they took one but they didn't take sannyas. So, Prabhupada, what to say of second sannyas? Prabhupada even said that Brahman diksha is not necessary. So, then that second diksha is not necessary, then why third diksha is necessary? So, how do we get the spirit from his books? That's why we need to pray to Prabhupada, read him extensively. Don't just take one quote and start quoting that. Read Prabhupada extensively, try to hear about hear what Prabhupada's teachings are from different devotees and uh, try to gain a holistic understanding. So to get the spirit of the books, most important in my understanding is always keep in mind what, what Prabhupada wanted. What Prabhupada wanted. Prabhupada wanted everyone to be Krishna conscious. So all other musts that may be there, they're all subordinate to the point of Prabhupada wanting everyone to be Krishna conscious. So So that's why we have to see, focus on Prabhupada's purpose. Not so much on this statement of Prabhupada or that statement of Prabhupada or this action of Prabhupada or that action of Prabhupada. Because Prabhupada was dynamic. Prabhupada was responding to situations. Prabhupada was guiding different people. Prabhupada was a living Acharya. Prabhupada was not like a robot who was simply okay, pressing a button and spouting out verses. Prabhupada was literally, Prabhupada was actually compassionately looking at people and being guided by Krishna to, to, to give answers and to respond in a way that was best for the person over there. That's why it's important, very, very important that uh, rather than simply quoting Prabhupada, we need to try to understand the purpose of Prabhupada and see how we in our personal life and in our outreach can help others fulfill the purpose of Prabhupada. So, what to speak of Prabhupada saying that uh, initiation is a must, sorry, sannyas is a must. Most of the life members that, Prabhu, that help Prabhupada big time in, uh, in, in building the temples. And Prabhupada was immensely grateful to them. Prabhupada didn't even insist that they take first initiation. Prabhupada, during his last days, he he. He offered a special gift. He got his, his own ne a necklace or something from his own personal paraphernalia. He said, give this to George Harrison. Prabhupada remembered him. And he had not even taken first initiation. So, Prabhupada had come to give us Krishna. And all the musts that we may have said, they are all meant to help us in reaching Krishna. So, for different people, some musts may be important. Some musts may not be important. So, if we start obsessing on the letters, on the specific words of Prabhupada, then all that will happen is we will become fanatical and we will dissipate all our energy in arguing with each other. So I was in Texas. Texas is considered to be the hotbed of uh, aggressive evangelical Christianity. They're out to convert people. So in front, I, devotees were driving me for a program in front of, there was a car. And it said that um, the Bible says it, I accept it, that settles it. The Bible says it, that were three statements. Which are there. The Bible says it, I accept it, that settles it. Oh, really? Okay. The Bible says that on Sunday, if anybody does any work, that person should be punished. So are you going to punish all the people who are working on Sundays? The Bible says that anybody who commits adultery, that person should be stoned to death. Are we going to do that in today's world? There is one 
there's one christian only has written a book as i think the book i forget the name of the book but the theme of the book is living the bible literally for one year take the statements of the bible and literally i'm going to apply them in my life it's just not possible and it's a, it's a, it it is a hilarious book it is a ludicrous book it comes in situations just can't live literally prabhupad himself didn't live literally every scriptural conjunction the manusmriti and the dharma shastra says sanyasi shouldn't travel abroad prabhupad traveled abroad so if we get caught in the letter of scriptures we will we will end up destroying we will end up causing so much conflicts now that doesn't mean prabhupad's purpose is to be that prabhupad's words are not important of course they are important that doesn't mean prabhupad's examples are not important they are important however they all need to be seen in the light of prabhupad's purpose okay thank you so there are some questions which i don't see directly relevant to the topic so and since we have already spent a good amount of time in questions i'll kindly i'll please keep those questions for later and we'll move ahead so now we talk about prabhupad's diligence in expanding the bhagavatam tradition globally so what is happening over here is that if you consider this is the bhagavatam commentary that was mm, his magnum opus he spent more time on his bhagavatam commentary than on anything else and in fact if you consider how prabhupad wrote his bhagavatam commentary also it's remarkable we generally speaking suppose we go and suppose we are we have a great desire for sharing krishna bhakti and we go to a particular town we go to a particular village or we go to a particular city and then we may give a few talks we may try to share krishna bhakti and see how much is the interest and then we may decide okay you know there's a good amount of interest over here let's start a weekly program over here then from the weekly program we say okay you know let's there are a good number of people coming let's try to have a base over here where people can come more frequently also if they want then let's have a small center then when we can have a proper temple then we can have a big temple so but suppose somebody goes to a place and nobody has come for a program but this we are going to build a multi crore temple over here wow really really okay is that is that sound is that realistic we may say we may have some second thoughts about doing something like that or somebody does like that so this is very courageous this is very ambitious so prabhupad's writing the bhagavatam commentary was like that prabhupad if we consider prabhupad's extraordinary ambition so he was a person who in the 1955 1960s roughly till 1960 till even 1960s we could say 19 so yeah prabhupad was an unknown was a unknown spiritual teacher or author he had had no noteworthy success back to god it we know he tried to distribute but people were not interested he would request people to buy but people were not ready to take it he had tried to establish a league of devotees that had not worked out he had tried various things it had not worked out much and prabhupad wanted to speak in english now one reason it had not worked out was that prabhupad was writing and speaking english and india still in the british they educated some people so that they could work in the british government but most indians didn't speak english so the language was a big barrier in vrindavan and in delhi so it was just that prabhupad did not get much audience and at that time so he had no finances he had no followers he had no reputation and at that time prabhupad decided to take up this project this massive project of translating and commenting on the whole bhagavatam and it's just staggering to imagine it as a author generally you know i whenever write a book i think you know okay who is the audience how how will we be able to publish the book do we have the funds for publishing the book do we have some resources for distributing the book that's a common sense approach and that's how most people should approach it but prabhupad 
he had no funds even to get the paper to print the bhagavatam he would struggle to print even the bt which is relatively smaller and yet prabhupada at that time decided to embark on this multi volume project prabhupada at that time pl- actually planned smaller volumes uh, and he planned 50 volume set bhagavatam so now we have 12 cantos and 18 volumes but when prabhu initially published it prabhupad published actually uh, the first canto in three volumes so his plan itself was mind boggling now how did prabhupad have such such a, what is the yet planned yet he planned a 50 volume series and you know we could say okay he planned a 50 volume series but prabhupad could have been in a hurry let me complete this you know it is such a big book and prabhupad could have said decided let me just keep short purports so that i can keep translating and taking it ahead see every long purport that prabhupad is writing it is taking that much of his time and that means for him to complete the bhagavatam is going to require that much more effort so we see here prabhupad's extraordinary faith in the bhagavatam that he had that con- deep conviction that this bhagavatam is what is going to equip me to go abroad it is the, the bhagavatam is what is going to help me to sorry so prabhupad felt that the bhagavatam was his ammunition for going to the west in fact if you look at the history in 1961 prabhupad uh started and and between 61 62 roughly in that period you can say uh the dates vary because we don't have precise historical record of every single thing but we could say in the period 1961 62 prabhupad completed the first volume of uh, canto 1 then in the next year whatever it is is 62 or 62 63 prabhupad completed the second volume and the next year prabhupad completed third volume so when prabhupad had this the three volumes are not three cantos there are three volumes of canto 1 itself so when he completed that prabhupad felt now i am ready to go to the west this is my this is my uh this is my ammunition these are my resources and of course when prabhupad did something ambitious you now it also it also provided something it, it was remarkable and it was appreciated prabhupad was the first Uh, translation commentary on the bhagavatam uh, the bhagavatam is although is the foremost book for the bhakti tradition and the gaudiya tradition but even beyond the bhagavatam is considered a very important book the bhagavat kathas are widespread so when prabhupad made this ambitious project to translate the bhagavatam now prabhupad's bhagavatam the result it was the first english commentary first comprehensive english commentary there are many who had translated the bhagavatam but uh, first comprehensive commentary on the entire bhagavatam and it was a it was a record because it was a record soon what happened was the indian prime minister and president both both the prime minister at that time was lal bahadur shastri and uh, the president was our former president was dr radha krishnan so they both gave very positive reviews to the for the book because prabhupad had actually had that courageous courageous confidence that this will make a significant difference even in india the prabhupad did not become a very like a best selling author he was still unknown author but he had done a significant achievement a landmark achievement that had not been done in the history of the indian tradition a translation commentary on the bhagavatam and with that prabhupad so in one sense that gave prabhupad had both he got both uh spiritual resources and we could say material credibility so the bhagavatam material credibility was when prabhupad was in the west you would say this is the book i have written and people would be impressed oh this i thought this is some strange old man he's written a whole book 
and they would take the book and they would say oh the prime minister of india the president of india have appreciated this oh that's impressive so prabhupad labored tirelessly and prabhupad took the bhagavatam with him when he went abroad in fact prabhupad was so immersed in the consciousness of the bhagavatam that he even said at th- that time that what's happening over here yeah okay i think i'll we'll not be able to complete this whole thing today and we'll discuss the markine bhagavat dharma and the um, other things a little later but let's look at some points over here at one time when prabhupad was in the early days uh, when he was planning to go abroad 1964 65 things were very finalized when people would ask him swami ji i heard you are planning to go to america and prabhupad was so unassuming said no i am not going to america bhagavatam is going to america prabhupad considered himself not so much a teacher of bhagavatam as simply a carrier of the bhagavatam so now prabhupad's propagating krishna consciousness was historic it is a prophetic propagation what is prophetic means i thought they added this play of words prabhupad's prophetic propagation so pra 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 that sound comes thrice so what is happening over here is there is a prophecy and prabhupad by propagating the bhagavatam fulfilled that prophecy now what was the prophecy there was a traditional prophecy that bhakti devi will travel to the west and bhakti will travel beyond the beyond the beyond the ocean and she will flourish and she will bring flourishing to human society all over the world and lord chaitanya had made promised the prophecy that uh, that krishna's holy name will spread all over the world and prabhupad fulfilled those prophecies now we could also say that there was also one more prophecy if you put it over here as personal prophecy was i mean person means not his prophecy but prophecy about him that the astrologer had said that he is um mm, astrologer on his birth had said that he will he will cross the oceans he will build he will spread he will become a deliverer of the world he will build 100 temples so prabhupad fulfilled that so now prabhupad in one sense prabhupad's mission was fulfilling all these so he was he was actually fulfilling a prophecy he was himself a very resourceful courageous and devoted and not a resourceful courageous expert preacher but he also knew that behind him assisting him empowering him was this whole tradition in fact before prabhupad went abroad it is said that he spent time in mayapur he spent time in vrindavan especially in vrindavan he spent time and he got the blessings of the goswamis so that he could fulfill their mission he could carry their message further and when prabhupad he went abroad we see that when he was confronting the american coastline he is singing the song markini bhagavat dharma the song itself is what how to preach the bhagavatam markine bhagavat dharma and when he is talking about that song in that song we'll discuss the song and we'll discuss the some of the teachings of the bhagavatam in our next session but what is prabhupad thinking that i have come here to preach the message of the bhagavatam and he is quoting the bhagavatam also prabhupad is not thinking that i am going to do something miraculous he is saying i am going to simply repeat the bhagavatam now of course repeat doesn't mean prabhupad simply recited the sanskrit verses no repeat means is present in a way that is intelligible and prabhupad prayed to krishna please make my words intelligible to them so but prabhupad saw himself as the messenger of the bhagavatam as a carrier of the bhagavatam and he presented the bhagavatam he said this is what i am going to do dheera hayya shunya jadi kane bar bar bhagavater katha sei tab avatar dheera hoya shunya jadi kane bar bar so he said he so prabhupada was not thinking he was alone he thinking that krishna is with me because krishna is manifesting as the bhagavatam it is you it is your avatar krishna bhagavater katha sei tab avatar tab avatar 
एंड इफ समी हियर्स दिस धीर हया शुने जली काने बार बार वन हियर्स दिस अगेन एंड अगेन दैट पर्सन विल बिकम धीर दैट पर्सन विल बिकम सोबर दिस वाज प्रभुपाद्स प्रभुपाद्स फोकस ऑन द भागवतम सो दिस वाज प्रभुपाद विल टॉक अबाउट द बुक द धर्मा बुक इन नेक्स्ट सेशन बट प्रभुपाद्स एक्स्ट्रॉर्डिनरी विजन वाज दैट he foresaw a global living bhagavatam tradition when it seemed to be declining even its home place india that it is not that if you see consider most indian temples mm-hmm. even now and even a few decades ago or half a century ago the temples were mostly places for rituals people would go there for darshan people would go there for puja but teaching of the bhagavatam that would happen occasionally bhagavat kathas would periodically happen at the time of festivals and other things but it is prabhupad who now you remember prabhupad translated the first canto of the shrimad bhagavatam in the first volume in 1960s when he was still an unknown swami league of devotees had not worked he was not with the gaudiya math he was on his own and prabhupad translates vitam bhagavat seva as by attending the bhagavatam class daily by daily attendance in the bhagavatam class well where, where is this daily bhagavatam class going on it was not going on anywhere but prabhupad had that vision so that it will happen and prabhupad said time is separating us there are temples and temples are filled with devotees what are temple what are the devotees doing in the temples yes they are dancing and there are beautiful deities they are worshiping the deities along with that they are hearing the bhagavatam so we are a part of the bhagavat tradition and what prabhupad foresaw what prabhupad envisioned he he through his disciples he it has been fulfilled now through his followers it has been fulfilled so i'll make this one point which is a very important point which we'll conclude now that some some people feel that you know prabhupad he want to translate the bhagavatam and it was not completed so was it a mission, incomplete mission prabhupad departed with, in the middle of the 10th canto not in the middle of the first part in the 14 chapters he completed no actually in one sense prabhupad's departure also demonstrates the truth that it is not a mission that is going to ever be completed and it is not a mission that is left incomplete rather it is a mission unending prabhupad's purpose was not just to translate and comment on the bhagavatam yes prabhupad's purpose was that but it was much more it was to inspire generation and generations of devotees to continue speaking on the bhagavatam to continue sharing the glory of the bhagavatam and in one sense what prabhupad started he empowered his followers to complete so prabhupad continued speaking on the bhagavatam hearing the bhagavatam remembering the lord till his disappearance if you see that <clears throat> the documented the final test you know prabhupad is so weak that he can barely speak his lips are not moving is there's hardly any sound coming out and the devotees are holding the dictaphone right close to his mouth and prabhupad is commenting his body may be weak but his consciousness is clear and prabhupad he continued glorifying the bhagavatam so yes we don't have his commentaries for the later can later can last 11th and 12th cantos and yes that we can say that's a great loss from one perspective but from another perspective that prabhupad demonstrated parikshit maharaj's example this is parikshit maharaj hearing the bhagavatam absorbed in the bhagavatam departed from the world similarly prabhupad absorbed in the bhagavatam departed from the world and just as Balishit Maharaj's legacy was continued on by Jan Meja and other kings. So Prabhupada's legacy is continued on by the followers of Shri Prabhupada. So he, the glorification of the Bhagavatam continues on even after the departure of Prabhupada, and that is the glory of the tradition that he inaugurated. So he didn't just glorify the Bhagavatam, but he created a tradition that can continue relishing the Bhagavatam and sharing the Bhagavatam. for thousands for 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 millennia to come for who knows how long this will legacy will continue by the lord's mercy by shri prabhupad's mercy so this is prabhupad's gift to us and in the next session we'll discuss speci- more specifically about now what was prabhupad's mood
what what sections of prabhupa bhagavatam did prabhupa emphasize how did prabhupa comment what was prabhupa's uh, what was prabhupa's vision of what he was doing what was prabhupa's expectation of what he was going to achieve through the bhagavatam we'll discuss this and we'll get a different deeper appreciation of prabhupa's comment purports in the next session or prabhupa's overall pr- presentation of the bhagavatam in the next session so i'll summarize today we discussed about the theme of appreciating prabhupada's presentation of the bhagavatam and for the first i discussed the importance of the bhagavatam itself so in the indian in the indian tradition there is huge amount of literature with a million million verses and within this vast tradition there is also uh, the um, a, not just a large number of literature but a large number of uh, uh, divergent schools of thought also so two approaches to philosophy accept the reality of everyday experience and seek a deeper understanding the other is reject the reality of everyday experience and seek some higher understanding so we have both these those extremes charvak is uh, so charvakism says all that only our everyday experience is real nothing else is real and advaitism shankarai advaitism says that our everyday experience is not real at all but within that is gaudiya vishnu there are levels of reality and that is what the bhagavatam also teaches so the bhagavatam is the ripened fruit of all that has come from the vedic literature so there are many diverge many uh, divergent schools of thought that emerge and the bhagavatam uh, is the culmination of all those schools of thought it is spoken by vyasadev in his maturity it is written by him so the bhagavatam in that sense gives the samam bonam the ultimate reality and then in the gaudiya tradition the bhagavatam is specially important because the gaudiya tradition focuses on krishna as sadhya and bhakti to krishna in the mode of radharani as the sadhan and the bhagavatam is the book also which systematically and consistently focuses on krishna and it's krishna shiksha in the 11th canto krishna leela in the 10th canto and there is a reference to krishna in all the cantos and there is a elaborate prelude like a trailer in the first canto so and especially there's a ras pancha adhyay which which points towards the glory of radharani and then throughout the bhagavatam also bhakti is repeatedly emphasized and we will discuss that theme of how bhakti is emphasized throughout the bhagavatam in an exception but the so sadhana and sadhya that are the emphasis of the gaudiya tradition they are what are emphasized in the bhagavat in the bhagavatam and the bhagavatam is the sarva pramana chakravarti the, the emperor of all pramanas for various reasons it 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 establishes it focuses on the highest reality and the purest path to attain the highest reality it addresses universal questions it focuses on the ultimately important question that when death comes what is the key thing to do in our life and in this way from various perspectives we can understand the uh, the universal relevance of the bhagavatam then it discuss how historically because chaitanya mahaprabhu said it's a natural commentary but it is not it was not a literal commentary so there are some problems so jeev goswami resolved the problem by writing the sandarbhas and uh, baldev devotion had to resolve the controversy by to establish the authenticity of the gaudiya sampradaya by writing a commentary on the vedanta sutra so there we discuss the concept of niyama agraha and then we discuss prabhupad's diligence in establishing a living bhagavatam tradition so prabhupad's magnum opus when he was an unknown author with no money to publish no publishers no no followers no potential buyers nothing at all no track record of any significant success in publishing at that time prabhupad had this super ambitious vision of uh, making a 50 volume translation of the commentary of the bhagavatam and just the first volume in first canto in three volumes when he was able to complete he felt so delighted by that that he decided he, he felt so empowered by that that he was able to that he said this is the ammunition i need and then further he got he got uh, the um, endorsements or reviews favorable reviews by eminent leaders of india and that gave him material credibility also and prabhupad then think i am going abroad rather the bhagavatam is going abroad and it is i who am the uh, it is i who, who am simply the carrier or the messenger of the bhagavatam 
and Prabhupada's focus was on that. We'll just speak the Bhagavatam in a way that people can understand and that will transform them. And Prabhupada foresaw a living Bhagavatam tradition and Prabhupada's apparent uh, leaving the Bhagavatam transformation complete actually indicates the ongoing unending nature of the Bhagavatam and its glorification. That Prabhupada, he showed through his own example how to keep doing it at the time till the last moment of one's life and how by his inspiration, that same glorification of the Bhagavatam, the spreading of the Bhagavatam's wisdom will continue even beyond him. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So is there any one quick question? We discuss and then we can end. So we'll continue in the next session. We'll be discussing the Markine Bhagavad Dharma song and the, uh, the Dharma, the chapter 1.2 of the Bhagavatam, which Prabhupada emphasizes especially. And we'll get a deeper understanding of how Prabhupada has presented the Bhagavatam expertly. Thank you very much. Kantra Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.